Mora conducts physician-led support groups, helping people live healthier, happier lives, free from chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. And on our podcast, Health and Mora with Dr. Lori Marbus, we bring to you nutrition and lifestyle medicine experts and extraordinary guests to empower and inspire you with their knowledge and stories of plant-based lifestyle so that you can be your healthiest self. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus, and today I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Rock Chitwani. How are you? I'm great. Nice to nice to meet you. Nice to be on your show, Lori. Fantastic. No, you've got a great story. And, you know, I really think people really enjoy hearing from physicians who have their own transformations, which you have quite a transformation. And now you have a, a new That's calling right. and purpose in life, which is really fun That's right. uh, to really hear. So let's go back to the beginning. Can you tell me a little bit about your history? First of all, why would you even want to go to medical school? What, what was your prompt there? Huh, that's a good question. Well, I, um, for my childhood, um, very much said I didn't want to be a doctor because um, that was something my parents wanted. Um, my parents are first generation Indian immigrants and many, I think many people obviously immigrate to this country and they want something better for their kids and South Asians in particular, it's probably true for other um, cultures, ethnicities as well, but South Asian in particular, they really, really are fond of their children going into medicine. <laughs> and so my mom would say that, and I would say, no, I'm definitely not becoming a doctor. And, um, and then as I got older, like in high school, one, I realized that I really had um, a strong um, motivation to serve and to serve other people in a capacity where I felt like I was bettering their life. And, um, and I had an inclination, like I really enjoyed science. Um, and I, I went to college sort of with this open mind. Um, I told my parents at that time too, I, I, I don't know what I want to do. And in the back of my mind, I thought maybe I want to do medicine, but I don't want to admit that. <laughs> and, um, and then I, and then I took, you know, sort of, pre-med classes, um, but I remember uh, meeting with the pre-med advisor and she said, well, you know, a lot of people say they want to go into medicine, but really the question you have to ask yourself is like, can you imagine working with people who are sick? And, and very quickly in my head, I was like, that feels right to me. I can't explain why, but I started volunteering at the hospital. Um, and I volunteer, volunteered at the, in the cancer ward, like just being a patient navigator um, at the university hospital I was at. Um, and then I took a seminar in death and dying. And I volunteered with the hospital chaplain. And I went to college in the South, in North Carolina, and at Duke, and um, to some very religious people. And uh, just a very religious culture, I should say. And uh, that was a very powerful experience, actually, to like go um, meet with people who were ill in the hospital and then to be with the chaplain who was trying to comfort and soothe them. And, I, and that experience like felt so powerful that I said, wow, I could have the opportunity to have these types of connections all the time and to provide this service and I like science. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, um, I, did, I decided kind of late then. So I took um, a gap year um, and I actually did um, AmeriCorps uh, in Chicago. I did part, part of AmeriCorps is this program called VISTA, which is Volunteers in Service to America. And I worked at a healthcare nonprofit um, in Chicago. I'm originally from Chicago. And uh, this was an organization trying to expand healthcare coverage for people in the city and the state and ultimately for the entire country, but um, really working to try and um, expand universal coverage, big proponent of a single payer system. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I learned a ton in that, uh, in that year. Um, one of the things we did was actually organize people who had a lot of hospital debt or medical debt. Um, we would, 
run a, a helpline for people and we would identify people with really compelling stories. And then we used uh, their stories to help uh, provide um, those stories to change legislate, like to lobby for legislation. I wasn't technically supposed to be lobbying <laughs> because that it's a government program. So I used to have to do some of that stuff. <laughs> I think I won't get in trouble now. That was in <laughs> 2002. Um, yeah, it's probably and then a I, time limit there. <laughs> and then I went to medical school and um, yeah, it was, you know, it was a lot. It was a lot of stuff to, you know, because it's just a lot of stuff to learn and you learn anatomy and then you go through your rotations. And it seems like at some point I lost sight of maybe why I went to medicine. I, I don't know. I, I say that because I, I felt like there were so many, there's always just so many like hurdles in medical school. Mm -hmm. There's all the big exams and then where are you going to go for residency? And, um, mm -hmm. but not, not completely. I think I knew I wanted to be an internist. Um, at th that I had realized at the end of medical training, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. Again, I thought maybe I'll specialize because it seems like that's what everyone's doing right now. But um, so I, I specialize, I, I, my original residency was in internal medicine and I matched in San Francisco at UCSF. So I'm not from here, but I was then dating, now married to someone who's from the Bay Area. <laughs> who said, and she was a year younger than me, um, also in medical school, um, went to different schools actually, but met through friends. And she said, I really uh, have been wanting to, she, she had been in Chicago for eight years. And she said, I really want to move back to San Francisco. And I said, well, I don't, I, there's a large chance I won't match there, but <laughs> we can try, I can try. And I was, I, yeah, and, and, and I feel very fortunate. I had a great experience in residency. I did a, a specific pathway in, at UCSF in health equity. And mm. so, um, which was centered at San Francisco General. Um, so on my elective time during my second and third year, um, we did um, all sorts of really interesting things like um, worked at community clinics and we got specific training in motivational interviewing um mm -hmm. actually through like an organization that does a lot of substance abuse counseling mm -hmm. uh in the east bay and at the time i remember thinking like i'm not going to do substance abuse counseling like why <laughs> i would and so for the listeners right motivational interviewing is a, a style of interviewing um where you're eliciting the individual's motivation for wanting to make change and it was developed originally in the substance abuse counseling um, uh, practice of substance abuse counseling, but now sort of broadly is used all throughout. Um, it's particularly useful in what we do, right, in lifestyle counseling. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, I remember thinking, like, <laughs> this is interesting, but I don't, when am I going to use this? So it's funny how the universe works like that. Um, <laughs> Because I didn't know what I wanted to be still, but I thought I wanted to be a kidney doctor, um, mostly because, mm -hmm. again, I really like science and I love like the nephron and all the electrolyte That's acid about the nerdiest problems. you can get, that and endocrinology. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. And math. I felt actually very like at home with that. So I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I should be a nephrologist. And so, again, I didn't decide till like towards the end of training. So I took a gap year. And I worked as a hospital phys hospitalist, hospital physician for a year before I went. I did end up going to nephrology fellowship, um, and then and then very quickly into that fellowship, I I realized I was like, oh, it's not just like really interesting <laughs> hospital cases that you're doing all the time. Like it's it's a lot of it is you're in the dialysis unit, and it's a lot of chronic management. Um, which is not bad. My wife is actually a nephrologist. Um, I just realized that it didn't really, it didn't really, well, I'll be honest. I, I think dialysis sort of become the default. A lot of things we do in medicine, right? These very kind of, I would say extreme things like, you know, taking over the work of someone's organ with this very convoluted machine is not normal, right? You'd agree. In fact, when dialysis was first developed it was so it was rationed because there were hardly any machines 
but now has become the standard. Like it's almost like default, right? Oh, okay, your mm-hmm. kidney fails and then you're gonna go on this sort of unnatural machine, um, which I think ha- is an excellent, amazing tool. And like much of what we do with medicine with like medications and technology, perhaps it's like just broadly gets applied to everyone as sort of default when it doesn't, I don't know if necessarily makes sense for everyone or we don't take the time to have the conversations um, about whether or not it makes sense because it becomes such the default. Um, So I realized I couldn't practice in that like environment. Like I thought first, I thought, well, maybe I should change. Like this needs to change. And I started developing like a research project on the ethics of um, ending dialysis and having those conversations. And um, and then we had our daughter, our first uh, child, uh, during that time when I was in fellowship. And after she was born. I just really started questioning like what I wanted to do with my life. I was like, do I want to change a system that, you know, I don't necessarily agree with that's just creating a lot of like tension and, 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 and stress in me. And like every day I would feel that I would go to work and I would be like, um, or, or, you know, I thought back to when, I worked as a hospitalist for that year and I got to, I was at a community, same, I'm at the same hospital now. I was at a community hospital. It's also an academic hospital. So there's training programs, uh, but it's a community hospital. And it's also like a tertiary referral um, center, like within the system. So saw interesting cases. I was working with residents um, and medicine training sort of trains you to be a hospitalist. <laughs> so it's good at it too. Like I felt very comfortable with it. So I was like, I'll do that. Cause I, again, I didn't, I was like, I don't really know what I want to do. I don't want to be a nephrologist. Mm. Like I, I started checking <laughs> off like the boxes of things that I was like, I can't go to every fellowship. So oh. I finished my first year. Um, and partway through that year, I, I, I decided, I, I kind of just got in touch with the people, um, the, the, the chief of the department I had, had been working with. Um, for that gap year and because I was feeling so guilty where I was feeling like I had done this terrible Mm. thing like I was going to let down my mentors and um, and and so when the hospital I worked at said oh we'd love to have you back it felt like this weight was sort of lifted like oh I don't have to do this thing that felt like a terrible wrong decision yeah. And then not, in retrospect, of course not. Like there were lots of things I could have done. I could have, you know, applied for other jobs. But at the moment I was just feeling like this is the end of the world. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. Right. I'm leaving all these things I built up to this. And I don't know. You tell yourself this story. Um, well, you know, and those d- decisions always lead to other opportunities. You have a very good knowledge base now about renal function, which is <laughs> interesting as we get into further topics but you know if you look back at just your storyline that you just shared it's a lot of service you're you're thinking about the ethical side of things you're thinking about having to make things better is this the right choice so it doesn't surprise me that you're at where you're at (laughs) it really doesn't I mean if you look back Mm. it's like pretty 2020 interesting Um, yeah no that was that was a definite common thread through is that's where it's led you and that's where a lot of people end up in medicine who enjoy lifestyle medicine is just it's the Hmm. service component right I had this similar thing because I wanted to be in the military and serve and thinking this would be my life and then after four years I'm like get me the heck out of here (laughs) because I love the people but I cannot do this anymore and yeah so I mean I totally get that Oh, I totally get it. I totally get it. Um, there's so many people on your path. I can't even tell you how many conversations that I've had with similar folks. Um, but this makes it interesting though. But so during this time, you, you know, that I'm sure this is highly stressful. So tell us about the next phase. Oh, yeah. Like you're dealing That's with the great. stress and what, how did you deal with stress and what did that lead you yeah. to your own health consequences? That's right. That's right. Um, no, that other part I, of the story. I, I dealt with stress, I think for much of my life, 
um, with food. Mm. I, from a very early age, I learned, you know, I learned, everyone learns like how comforting food can be. And we always say this now, I don't know if it's true, but I grew up in the early eighties. Right. And it was, oh, we didn't, my parents will say, we didn't know how bad sugar was. And I think that's true. Like, I think we yeah. knew it was bad, but not like how we know it is now. Like right. they used to get us whatever cereal, you know, I'm not, and again, I'm not, I mean, they were just, they were just like, this is what everyone does. I would yeah. have Coke, like, you know, I, they limited it, but they were like, you can have it on the weekends. Uh, my children have never tried regular soda. <laughs> you know, honestly, it's, it's interesting though, because when I grew up, we didn't have it just because we couldn't afford it. I mean, literally we could oh, not, wow. there were, yeah. there were months that if my grandmother didn't bring us groceries, we wouldn't have eaten. And so we grew oh, our wow. vegetables. We had a ton of potatoes and beans. We had some meat, but it was expensive. We had dairy. Yeah. Um, but uh, honestly, I would, we ate a popper's diet that was really healthy just because, but we never had the processed food. My mom would like, you get box cereal. My mom's like, no, we're going to get oatmeal and grits. That's what you're getting. <laughs> And 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 that cereal. and that was like amazing for for your habits and health probably at the time you were probably yeah. really like oh I wish I had whatever yeah. lunchable or that's when I was a kid I and, did honestly I coveted my friends that had right. all these little cute little that's snacks right. and stuff I mean that's I remember right. days my mom would put two slices of bread together and butter and that was my lunch I mean it was bad mm -hmm. <laughs> so I totally appreciate that but my husband's family my husband's Filipino. And his family came from the Philippines and he was born here. Very similar experience. He's like, they would buy him bags of chips. They were military. And so they, they, he goes, we have right. a bag of Cheetos gone before we got home. <laughs> and listen, it, if you're an immigrant and you come here and then you mm -hmm. work hard and do well, then part of that American like lifestyle is like, because in India, they couldn't buy any of that stuff. Right. They wanted that stuff or they saw that stuff on TV and they would be like, you know, they might once in a while get a, a soda or something, but it was so uncommon uh, that then they came here and they're like, oh, this stuff is everywhere. And now we can give, but no, I, I, the, I don't want to give the blame to my parents, actually. But they ate a very simple, like Indian, they tried very hard to make that um, like the food we ate. And mm -hmm. I was just exposed you know like yeah when I got to high school and I think my senior year of high school you could go off campus and I was like I can go to McDonald's every day <laughs> and for two dollars you can get two cheeseburgers and two fries and, <laughs> like right and so that's I did that every day in senior year of high school I got the two dollar two che double cheeseburgers whatever at McDonald's I will tell you <laughs> what happened when I was a kid you know what my parents did to prevent us from wanting to go out to eat was that my dad, my stepdad would tell me that the McDonald's hamburgers made out of worms and all, all these stories. And <laughs> I knew as I got older, that was BS, but I would not for the life of me, just the thought of eating anything like that grossed me out so much. I was like, I want no part of it. <laughs> that's that's anyway. smart. That's smart. Oh no. I'm, and then when I got to college, it was even worse. There was a Chick-fil-A oh, on my campus. Oh, which highly addictive. Know. <laughs> highly addictive I didn't know what waffle fries I was like I don't know what these things are there's something special about them that's all I could say <laughs> um I, and then and then my freshman year my grandfather died oh. and um that was like the first like close family member that had died and and it's interesting I mean he grew up not that far from us um he lived with my cousin my aunt and uncle and so I used mm -hmm. to see him all the time and I don't know if I was particularly close to him, but I just saw him all the time. Um, and it affected me like way more than I was expecting. Like I was, I remember, I think it was like my, you know, I was in pre-med bio and there was a big exam. And then I found out mm. and I flew home for a couple of days. And um, I don't know, I was like, I wanna do something hard to remember how fortunate I am and to remember him. Mm. and. I asked myself, what could I do that's really hard for me? Like that would be a reminder. And I was like, oh, giving up meat because I love meat. <laughs> I love meat a lot. So I became a vegetarian. Um, from that point on through, I think my first year of medical school. So for like six years, wow. um, I was a vegetarian and I was um, 
like so on like I was the unhealthiest vegetarian right like very very early on I was like okay I can't eat meat anymore what can I do and I found Morningstar Farms and Boca mm -hmm. and I, you open my fridge and freezer in college it was like full of all of these that's all I ate and mm -hmm. cheese pizza and you know like veggie like so I ate a lot of cheese I ate a lot of uh, processed meat and mm -hmm. and coke and like there was a coke the machine Oreos on the and floor. Dr. Pepper. <laughs> That's right. There was a coke machine on the floor, and I was like, "You oh, can wow. have this every day, and you can use your card." Like, <laughs> it blew my mind, and I was like, "I oh, was a you card know, like your your meal card." Yeah, you swipe your card, and you could <laughs> use it in the vending machine, and you could wow. order you could order Jimmy John's and you could order pizza and all these things. And then when I became vegetarian, I was like, I could still order all these things. <laughs> Just <laughs> So I, you know, and then when I got to medical school the first year, um, I found it very stressful. And, um, and I, none of the people I was like my roommate and the people I was eating with regularly were vegetarian. And so it was always having to order something separate or this, that, and it was, and, and I really remember, I really enjoyed meat. Like mm. it was like, I would see everyone eating it and I'd be like, I want that. I want mm. that. And so um, about six months into, I was like, you know what? I can't, it, this is, this is negatively affecting me. Uh, my, that's what I told myself. I'm going to go back to eating meat. So mm. I did. And I, I went back like really hard. <laughs> like I started going to like in Chicago, there's all these steakhouse. I mean, and I was a student, so I didn't have a lot of money, but like we um, you know, on on like my roommate's birthday, we would go to a steakhouse or something, or uh and certainly like I was like getting back, I was like, oh, there's all these different burgers. Do you know White Castle? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I never ate there, but yeah, I know what they are. <laughs> I wish I had any. No, no, I shouldn't say that. But I know I, my, I ate plenty of Chick fil A after my these <laughs> little up. burgers and, I, was adult, and yeah. I would yeah. be studying and I'd order that. Or again, it was just sort of like this is the food that comforts stress. Mm -hmm. And it was like pizza. It was, you know, I had to order at every restaurant Taco Bell, Pizza Hut. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter, Popeyes and I just, um, I didn't see a problem with it. You know, in fact, it was sort of like, I'm working so hard. Mm -hmm. I, this is how I treat myself. I deserve this food and, and didn't realize it until, you know, just doing that for years, as you can imagine, it catches up with you. And I was doing that um, intermittently. I would like, like when I got married in 2009, I was like, I want to lose weight for my wedding. So I just, cut a lot of that stuff out and I cut my portions down a lot I didn't really change the food I was eating I just started eating less of it and I forced myself to run every day and then um I lost 30 pounds in like a few months and then uh the day after my wedding uh I ordered my wife answers the door I was in the shower and I come out and she's like are you having people over and I said why and she said you've ordered enough barbecue like I ordered ribs and barbecue chicken and mac and cheese all this stuff and I, I I have not eaten any of this stuff for you know however many months I had this is and what happened of course in a few months I regained those 30 pounds and more and in the midst of all like my career decision and residency residency you know you pull 36 hour shifts every few days which in retrospect I'm like how did we do that <laughs> I think it's like um, anyway yeah. I think it's insane yeah. but you do that by eating this stuff eating like sugar and caffeine and just like keeps you going and then um and then my daughter was born and um and then I went back to work as a hospitalist um and having a child and having a new job being a young physician all very stressful and they get at the hospital, they cater food every day, Chinese food, Thai food, mm. pizza. Like this is the food, right? They, they, we feed the doctors. And so I would eat that every day. And, um, and I think I, I saw this wellness speaker when I started who went through like the phases of, of a physician, like a physician's career. Mm. And I, this always resonated with me. Um, and when you start off right after training, it's sort of the heroic phase. 
where you're like, I'm a new doctor and I can do all these, you know, wonderful things for people and I can write a prescription. Like, you can, like maybe in residency it's that, but even out, right outside of training, it's the sort of this heroic phase and the heroic phase can last like a couple years, two, three years before eventually you enter what he called the doldrums. <laughs> And the doldrums are like where you're like you know what you're doing but it's sort of this day-to-day -day. um some people that happens five years ten years into their career some people I'd say for me um it happened maybe four or five years into my career and um mm -hmm. I was just sort of like every day showing up to work and I felt like I was maybe starting to go through the motions a little bit and um and then I would come home and I'd have this litany of, and at this point we had two kids. So we had my daughter was three and we had a one year old. And I would, I would tell them, anyone who would listen, like this happened today and this happened today. And this nurse did this and they're making me work this shift. And I don't know, I was, uh, I was like uh, always complaining, always complaining until you know my wife pointed out and she would point out, she would say, we, we were in a good mood and then you came home oh <laughs> and i know right and i i i said to her i said you know i don't get to complain at work i have to be collegial and that's how it was to me at the time i thought this is i'm playing a part at work where i have to be this co collegial person now, honestly that's how i felt and one time she said to me she said why why is it fair that the people you say you love the most get the worst version of you? Mm. And that didn't feel good, you know? It's like, no, that's not it at all. I love you guys. And, and, and that, I say that now, like at the time, I don't think I realized that that was really an act of kindness. Mm. that was, she was being so honest with me um this is the people that you care about the most that you show that honesty and you're you know she she knows she knew how how reactive i was and wondering like should i even talk to him about any of this because he's only going to get more you know upset or annoyed um and serendipitously, um, there was a, a evening work session and required to do like a certain number of hours of these extra off work like learning um, sessions every year. And one of them was run by the physician wellness group and it was called evidence-based workplace happiness. And it was mm. uh, all the things you can do to be happier, which when I read that, I said, uh, is there dinner? <laughs> Are they serving food? And okay, I'll go to this. It's, it sounds interesting, but um, but it also I was skeptical because I was like, that's not really that's not really my choice. Um, so I went to this talk. It was two hour session at night, and there were a bunch of people there. and And I remember one of the first things they talked about was gratitude and how you showing gratitude regularly is a way that you can be happier and I was like okay that sounds good but then they said no we're going to have you experience it and they had us pull out our devices our phone and uh they said we're going to send a message send an email or a text to somebody you work with and tell them specifically why you appreciate them and I had an office mate at the time this guy Ray um who had been he's 20 he's like 15 20 years uh senior to me um and so he would give me a lot and he had also three kids and um and his kids were older and so i would just get a lot of really like sage advice from him and he's just also like someone i could go to with clinical questions and um and i had certainly been talking to him about like my struggle and in my home and i told him that i said ray i just really appreciate you and like your friendship and um having support from you and this work makes it a lot better mm. and so i put my phone away and then they said how do you feel and i was like oh i feel better <laughs> it's like i feel better actually i do feel better i was like that was a life for me i was like oh wait 
you mean I could do that every day and I would feel better? And I was like, what else could I do? And then they started talking about what else can you do? And that's when I learned about, I heard about, I mean, I actually tried meditation in the past. I grew up in a Hindu family and my, my faith is Hinduism. I tried like some meditation in college and not with the effect of sort of being more present and mindful. Um, I didn't really know um, what my motivation for, for wanting to try, maybe just more to calm my mind. But, um, but then I downloaded the Headspace app, you know, and because um, that's what they they recommended. And I started, uh, I started doing it in my car, I started meditating in my car for 10 minutes. Uh, I would pull off to the side of the road by our house. And, um, and I didn't know what to expect from it. All I knew is that I sent a text message to Ray and I felt better. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> let me try this out too. And then, uh, and then within a few weeks, my wife pulled me aside and she said, what's going on with you? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, I don't know. You just seem like you're in a better mood when you come home and you're, mm -hmm. you're just like more present. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, yeah, I'm kind of like wanting to do that, you know? And, and she said, and you're coming home a little. <laughs> no. I said, I'm meditating in my car, I swear. And she didn't believe me. I was like, no, I'm using this app. And she, she didn't meditate at the time either. And, um, and, and then she also, she was like, I'm glad it's working for you. Um, Cause I kept telling her, I'm like, this is the best stuff ever. <laughs> you have to do this. It, it really um, starts to change your relationship with your thoughts and starts to create the space where you can start responding instead of reacting. I started telling her all these things. And, um, and eventually she tried, she tried it. Um, no, not again, nothing bad to my, we had three young kids and there was one night where she was just like, I came home and the kids were like, they were almost like, they were like a little afraid because she was yelling. She was like yelling. She, I think was kind of really at her wits end. Um, and then I saw her and she was kind of shaking. And I said, why don't you go upstairs, take some time to yourself. And then she came down uh like an hour later and she said I, I tried the app and it really helped <laughs> it really helped me calm down and sort of see myself in in that moment and so now we both have become like really big believers and I talk to a lot of my patients about it. but anyway that back to that I mean that was that was where I feel like everything kind of changed for me mm. uh because I started looking at my life as more of a series of choices, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to being like a victim of circumstances. Yeah, that's that's a big part of it. I I think it's uh, almost like when you are first confronted with patients who start a plant based diet and they see numbers changing, and it was all because of choices. So the chronic disease is not a sentence right. that was given to them that they can't you know it wasn't their genetics and it wasn't you know just their luck of the draw. Right. it was like these are decisions and it honestly empowers you and gives you joy in the fact That's that right. you, wait a minute I do have a choice and all of those things come to I feel like you know your whole life you kind of you're, or you're, the what you told me I don't know you 100 <laughs> but but it was interesting how you kind of floated between things right and kind of but then when you get to this point of just sitting back and thinking and observing, because which is basically what meditation yeah. is, right? You're observing That's right. The, That's right. the situation. It gave you the power to see that you don't have to react to the emotions or the thoughts That's right. or anything. They That's don't right. own you. It's a, it's a right. very powerful place to be um, in a, a relief. <laughs> I find it as a relief because you don't have to react to all That's these right. thoughts and emotions. You're like, wait, I'm That's not right. that thought. I'm just observing right. that thought. I'm not That's that right. emotion. It's going to pass. Right. And so it's very, it's a uh, empowering to, to see that, but it's a lot of that is it's, it's pretty cool. So then what led you down the lifestyle medicine track? Well, like, where did that, you know, come? it's, it's just what you're saying. Like I started observing my thoughts and emotions and mm -hmm. I started realizing, um, that I was making a lot of choices that didn't really align with what I said. I, I said I wanted to be like a good father. I said I wanted to be 
there for my kids. And I would come home and, you know, I was, I was suddenly like, like having a lot more fun, like we're having dance parties and playing games and all these things that I, I, that were accessible to me. And I started realizing like, yeah, I have to like be around for them. Like I can't just go on living based on my, like my hedonistic <laughs> pleasure wheel where I was, right. what can I eat? That's really enjoyable. There was a, uh, there's an in and out next to a Krispy Kreme, not too far from where I oh live. My. And like so a deadly combination. Post call, post call in residency. <laughs> that was, I would go there. Cause when you put your order in at the in and out, you can go get, right. I was like, I, that, how, how, how can I reconcile what I'm doing right now? Like, and with, with these three little faces. So um, <laughs> as luck would have it, again, at work, um, there was a doctor from Sacramento, South Sacramento, who came to give a CME talk on plant-based eating. And Which he doctor? told his story. Rajiv Mesquita? I don't know him. Are you familiar I know, with him? I know some he's of your Kaiser folks, but not him. Okay. Oh, he's, he's, he's well, he's an amazing, uh, amazing individual, amazing human being. You should have him on your podcast yeah. um he when he was 40 he started getting chest pain i am tell you the whole story but he started getting chest pain he drove himself to the emergency room he was dropping his kids off at school they had blockages um oh. cardiac blockages and so they stented him and nobody talked to him about diet or lifestyle right he went on american heart association diet started exercising more starting lean meat instead of red meat started um using olive oil and then, and then like six months later, he was at the gym on the treadmill and started getting chest pain again. Went back to the hospital. His stents had closed off. He had more disease. He needed bypass surgery. And so he started asking, he's like, what, what can one do, right? And so he, it didn't take him long. He, he like looked in the literature and he's like, oh, you can actually reverse heart disease with diet? Like, why has no one told me this? Like, why did I have the first procedure and no one said, like, and by the way, if you want to prevent, <laughs> so he made it his mission to go around to every medical center at our, in our entire Northern California region to tell his story, to share this. And I was sitting in the audience um, and I remember hearing his story. I was, I was, he's Indian I, like me and I was six, I think five years younger than him, five years younger than when he had, I was 35 and he had his heart attack when he was 40. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking to myself, um, this is going to be me in five years. Like I can see this now. And the other thing that was so memorable about that session is that the lunch they served was a whole food plant-based lunch. And awesome. which at the time, like I would think is like rabbit food. Like, why would I eat this? But it was black bean and um, sweet potato quesadillas, but there was no cheese, right? It was just the mashed sweet potatoes and black beans. It was very well spiced. And it came with a side of guacamole and a side of really good salsa mm -hmm. and like whole wheat tortilla. And as I was eating, I was like, this is really good. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm really enjoying this. Like it's got acid and flavor and texture. And like they had made them a little crispy. And um, I didn't think much of it other than remember, I can think back to that now um, because I went back to the same talk. He didn't come back the next year. Somebody else from health education gave, because every year they do this three week plant-based challenge plant powered challenge and it's three weeks he, he started it like at his medical center and then it sort of spread and they'd been doing it for a couple years at my medical center um and i remember the first year hearing about it and sort of like why would anyone do that that was my <laughs> thought like why would anyone do that and the second year hearing his story and then saying like i need to do this and so i signed up for it and then the very next day like uh, went to the conference and they were serving like pizza or something. And I was like, I can't do this. <laughs> I can't do this because I was not ready to make that change. Like in my head, I thought this is something I should do, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what food I was going to eat. I didn't know how to cook the food. Um, so what I did do, thankfully, is um, I said, well, that black bean... <laughs> Sweet potato quesadilla is pretty good. And I bet there's more things like that. So I did Meatless Mondays 
for um, for about a year. Yeah, it was about a oh, year wow. because then the plant powered challenge came back. I said, I'm ready. <laughs> Let's do it. I knew what I was going to cook. I had learned how to make whole food plant-based lasagna. I had learned how to make all sorts of different tacos. It's like all the things I really love. Yeah. I learned how to like cook those things. And, and it didn't, I realized this, this whole world of making these things. Then I did it for three weeks, 100% whole food plant-based. This is going from you know, I was still eating. I, I, my fast food choices were getting better. Like, I don't know if you know, at like Taco Bell, they have a fresco menu. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> I know. Cool, but I would, <laughs> I would start, yeah, yeah. I I would get start getting some like healthier options mm -hmm. at these restaurants. But, um, but then for three weeks, I, um, I did a hundred percent. And then I felt like a different person. Like, mm -hmm. You know, it's not even an understatement. You're shaking your head because you, you, you've seen this probably so many people now. But at the time, I, I was like, it three weeks. But I was sleeping better. You know, I had a Fitbit at the time. This is the most amazing thing. My resting heart rate went from like the 80s. I have a screenshot of this because I show it sometimes. Uh, went from the 80s to the like 60s. Mm -hmm. And I didn't start exercising in these three weeks. I wasn't exercising at the time. Mm -hmm. It's just my heart was getting butter, blood flow. Mm -hmm. and that um wasn't enough evidence for me right after that I said okay I'm gonna do this 80 percent of the time 20 <laughs> percent of the time I'm gonna eat the food I love like on my birthday that year I went to a steakhouse because that's what I used to do I used mm -hmm. to when I had the opportunity I was like oh there's a steakhouse <laughs> and um and I remember my heartburn which I'd suffered from for so many years in residency and med school because at this point I went to the doctor Glory. And I, my, at this point, my weight had really, really gone up. I was obese uh, at that time. And then, uh, which my doctor told me, he's like, yo, you're, you know, he put on my problem list in the chart. He put obesity mm -hmm. on it. And then uh, my blood pressure was high. Uh, he said, well, we'll have you come back and recheck it. You don't have to start any medicines right now. My cholesterol my LDL cholesterol was like 168 or 170 or something like Your that. Your LDL was 160? LDL. Yeah, yes. Okay. <laughs> I know. It gives me a heart attack just thinking right. about that. Number. And I was pre-diabetic. <laughs> and I was pre-diabetic. Oh, wow. um, wow. And most of those things reversed in three weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. My blood pressure normalized. Uh, my cholesterol dropped like 40 points in three mm -hmm. weeks. Um, my pre-diabetes reversed. Um, and and I lost like 10 pounds. And I wasn't trying to lose. I mean, I, I the whole time I was like, I was like, uh this was going on I was like you know that's just my destiny I'm a bigger guy I'm you know I'm gonna kind of I never thought this is my choice this is the food I'm eating but it's so funny but now I get that so much with patients I never I, I you know it could be easy to be like why don't you understand no but I'm like no I totally get it I was living like mm -hmm. that for so many years and I um and then I uh I said, wow, I you know, lose weight, sleep better, have more energy. So I started that 80%, but then I went to that steak dinner, my heartburn came back, terrible heartburn that night. And I felt terrible the next morning. I almost like felt like sluggish. And I was like, oh, sounds maybe <clears throat> silly now. No, I don't think so. Like I didn't, it was more the light bulb moment again. It's like, oh, the food you eat, it affects how you feel. It doesn't, it's not just how it tastes. Right. It should taste good. I still believe my food oh, should absolutely. be delicious. I should want to eat yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And it has the opportunity to make you feel good. Mm -hmm. And then as <laughs> that year went on and I just gravitated towards eating the food that made me feel good and tasted good. And the cafeteria, I was like, oh, they make spring rolls, the Vietnamese spring rolls. They always used to get the one with shrimp, but right next to it, they have one with tofu. And I didn't, and you know, and, and then I was like, why wouldn't I eat the tofu? The tofu one makes me feel better and it tastes great. So it was that kind of thing that I just, I started doing that more and more and more and more until, um, until I was like, what is it that I like or that I used to eat? And how can I eat that now? You know, I discovered banana ice cream, ice cream. I was like, perfect. Now I don't have to like, now I have this like whole food plant-based version of ice cream that I can make on demand. 
and I can eat the whole blender and it's like I ate two servings of fruit. Like I didn't right. do something wrong. Exactly. I just did something good for myself. And it tastes like ice cream. So you're like happy even cream. more. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Oh my gosh. That's right. So what, tell us a little bit about, so you also had weight loss. How much weight did you end up losing? In the first year, I lost close to 50 pounds. Wow. Um, and then since then, I've probably lost more than 70 pounds. Um, and and the, I tell my patients all the time, I say, you know, the cool thing is when you find, when you eat this food and you find ways to, to love it and eat it in delicious ways, this is not like, what I had done for my wedding or what most people do to lose weight, which is that they punish themselves, right? Mm -hmm. This is actually giving yourself a gift every day. And you just gravitate towards this natural healthy weight because you're eating food that, you know, nature intended and, and you can't overeat, you know? I show that forks over knives diagram of what 500 calories looks like probably five times a day to my patients. Cause I'm like, this is the, you don't have to count calories. If this is all the food you're eating or 90% of the food you're eating, you can't overeat this food. And so that's also very wonderful because somebody, you know, who, who doesn't want to punish himself, like who doesn't want to count and write every little thing they're taking um, and wants to feel like they can eat and enjoy you know, and eat to satiety and eat to fullness and things like that. That's me very much. Like I like to, and now I feel when I get seconds or even thirds, I'm like, no, this is just even better for me. <laughs> I'm getting more polyphenols. You sound like you sound like my husband. The more plants, the better I am. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Speaking of uh, spouses, is your wife and your children follow suit? That's right. Um, so my wife is always a vegetarian. Actually. Oh, she was a vegetarian until she met me. <laughs> and then I got her to start eating meat. It's so terrible. <laughs> um, she started trying it. She never really like gravitated towards it, but she would have it. I think we'd go to restaurants and stuff. Um, but then like, then mostly I had kind of been a vegetarian and, um, and my in-laws who live in, nearby, like they, are also vegetarian and from very young age started feeding my children so my kids eat almost completely plant-based diet um but they often gravitated towards those things even before i made my change because that's mm -hmm. what my mother-in-law was feeding them very simple south indian vegetarian food like just lentils rice and simple vegetables and they would eat that from four months on so they developed a taste for it like my my middle son, who's eight, he loves uh, salad. Uh, yeah. Just, you know, he loved, they all love vegetables and beans. And we, at this point, have not said to them, you can't have whatever, like, and they go to mm -hmm. school and stuff. So sometimes they eat meat, like they'll eat chicken nuggets or something like that. And I've just been, we'll be out if we go to a restaurant or something, they will choose like a bean and rice burrito or they will choose mm -hmm. because they enjoy that. And they, mm -hmm. and I think back to when I was their age and I'm like, that was like the punishment for me. It's so interesting mm -hmm. how different, but we also celebrate now, especially since, since we've transitioned, I've transitioned to answer your question. Yeah. My wife has sort of embraced this as well. Um, she was always vegetarian. And then um, when I first told her, I came home, I said, I'm going to eat this way. She laughed. <laughs> she's like no you're not <laughs> I can't she's like didn't you say this a year ago and I was like that's why I've been doing meatless Mondays every Monday which she also thought was ridiculous because she's like I'm a vegetarian like you can't just pick one day a week and I'm like no you don't understand it was um, your primer it was your primer it was, it was, it was, it was <laughs> I was building now I understand it because now I've yeah. learned all these things about behavior change I was building my self-efficacy and my confidence mm -hmm. I was in the you know pre-contemplative contemplate, state and I was getting preparation and you like and to take so, your time that's right <laughs> in this state that's right that's right that's right and then um and then the very next day in this three-week challenge she bought a pizza sausage pizza for me for dinner and I said why did you get didn't you hear me yesterday I said I'm gonna and she said oh yes that's right I didn't think you were being serious about that and I didn't eat that pizza 
And oh, wow. I think that she, yeah, she was like, oh, wow, this is a, like, this something's is going something on. new. Something's <laughs> going on. Something's different. You're meditating in your car. You're telling me you want to eat plant-based diet. Like, I don't. Uh, and so I, um, I, over time, have, have really influenced the whole, like, now all the, my wife used, she likes to bake. And she used to mm -hmm. bake standard American, like, you know, butter, sugar, all eggs, all these things. Now she does complete whole food plant-based baking. Um, do you know whole food plant-based cooking show, Jill Dalton's uh, uh, YouTube I channel? I see, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with it. Yes, yes. Yeah, and she um, she makes all her desserts are whole food plant-based, sweetened with dates. Mm -hmm. um, and she makes a thin mint cookie cake, which if you've mm -hmm. never made that, highly, 100, 2,000% recommend it. It's the most moist, delicious, um, right, and the ca the frosting is cashews and dates and wow. cocoa powder and some peppermint um, extract, and the cake itself is oat flour and almond flour and dates as super moist. And we have that now. Even my kids ask for it for their birthdays. <laughs> they say, "Mommy, make that cake," and we Aww. just had it for my birthday, and even for her birthday, she'll make it <laughs> or I'll make it. Um, it's that good, right? Wow. And yeah. so that's that's. Um, yeah, pretty much everything. Most of the things we're eating. I mean, we buy some, like I have kids. So I started buying the impossible nuggets for them because I was like, okay, if you want to eat chicken nuggets, there's something that some lab close enough. <laughs> is close enough where you don't have to. Um, I recently have, I wasn't, so I, that was my goal, 80%, 90%. But recently I've, I'd say 100%. I recently decided I'm going to be vegan. I read um, Ed Winter's book which is this this is vegan propaganda and um and we got a dog during the pandemic and all of these things in my head I was just like I can't reconcile this anymore and mm -hmm. so I don't tell my patients necessarily and I don't encourage them I always emphasize like it's about eating more plants right because mm -hmm. you get the benefits and that's definitely what I experienced and what we know is like you get so much of the benefit from eating more plants and if you do it right, like you end up crowding out all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you keep crowding it out, eventually there's no more space <laughs> for anything but plants. Um, it's really but, interesting to me to how people will gradually go into it or overnight. So I was overnight. That's right. Literally. Oh, really? Oh, really? yes. So I, I told you earlier before we started how right. the patient came in and I started reading uh, the China study um, by T. Mm -hmm. Colin Campbell. It, I literally read that in two days. I was so like, I was telling my husband, I was like, look, they're turning off cancer by <laughs> yeah. eating plants. Yes. Like what is going yes. on? Right. And right. as I was in my own head, trying to figure out what this meant uh, personally in a practice, uh, for me, it was like, oh my gosh, this is such an amazing tool to use with patients. And um I had a patient with lupus that came in and living in Western Colorado in a little town, you're a lot of everything. So the nearest hmm. uh, rheumatologist was over an hour away and they only came in maybe once a month from Denver. So I lived on the other side of the Colorado state. Oh, wow. The Rock I mean, there's these big yeah. things called the Rocky Mountains on the other side. And so, um, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but she, I got her, she came in, she was on 12 meds. I put her on a plant-based diet because she said, I, 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 don't know what else to do. She was like, I feel horrible. I'm having migraines every day. She was 50 pounds overweight. I was mm. like, try this plant thing. I was reading about the anti-inflammatory component. Two weeks later, we measured her CRP. It was like three times high normal. Two weeks later, she had lost eight pounds. CRP had dropped yeah. wow. just outside normal. Her migraines were gone. Fast That's forward right. five months, stopped seven That's to 12 right. meds. Anyway, that night, That's after right. two weeks, came home overnight. Three teenagers that were going on the plant we said my husband's like are you still cooking he's like whatever <laughs> I'm like yes <laughs> he's like, he's like, so the kids were like don't argue with mom because mom you know going through medical school three little true. kids I they were five three and ten months when I started medical school and um, oh wow so wow. and being the military I was like listen I ain't I'm not your shorter cook I'm your mother you will eat what I have in front of you. Right. but when we went out though the kids would you know, order what they wanted. And like you said, you know, they choose to do things. That's what I noticed with my, my 13, 15 year old, my daughter went off to college and she took a little bit longer to come around, but she has, but um, <laughs> everyone's plant-based now. But the, the interesting thing was the boys started ordering tofu instead of chicken. Yeah. But I mm, totally get that. Yeah. But so yeah, yeah, yeah. 
now here you are, you've made these transitions, you're hundred percent, right. you're working towards, you know, sharing this message with your patients. Where, where would you do like, so what would be your advice to someone? Cause it's a really interesting path that you took. That's right. And these were all these light bulb moments for you. That's right. The universe, I don't feel like there are coincidences. I feel like it's just presented yeah. to you when you're ready to hear the message. That's right. But what, what do you think is, is your, your advice to someone who's contemplating yeah. this? <clears throat> well, I have, I've thought a lot about this because I, well, I meet patients in the clinic and it's like, sort of, what are the, and I think about my own experience, right? And it started with sort of understanding a bigger purpose, right? Mm -hmm. What are what are my bigger goals or aspirations for my life, for my kids, for my family, and what's meaningful to me? Um, that I would say is like uh, what I call the roots. Your roots. Mm -hmm. Your roots are what you know ground you. That's R. So this, by the way, is R A K. The, name, the letters of my name, R A K. So roots, and then from roots, it's like awareness. A is awareness, right? So really understanding, like, what is it that you do, and why do you do what you do? For food, it was like I always thought, and I help my patients now. Like, what is it you like about food, or what is it that keeps you eating the things that you eat? And so much of it is tradition and the emotion associated with food and how we use food for so many things, for comfort, for stress, um, and food addictions that we have because the food is designed that way. And so that awareness piece is like, okay, like, why am I eating? Like, why am I eating this? And why am I eating now? And what is it that I like about food? And how might I re-engineer like new food or different food to eat that way? But you could use that awareness piece for any change that you're trying to make, right? Mm -hmm. And then K is how you make change, which is kindness. Mm. And it goes back to like what I said is, you know, if you design a punishment for yourself, you're only going to do it for so long before, mm. you know, you're like, I don't want to punish myself anymore. And you'll go back to the thing that you think you deserve or that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. But kindness is different, right? Kindness is like, how can I make changes that feel good to me and are also good for me? Mm -hmm. and reflect that higher purpose aspiration you know because that feels good really you know to to live up to that and to move towards that with your choices and your behaviors feels really good too and kindness is also like showing up you know showing up for yourself i've, I've learned a lot about like self-compassion and self-kindness and you know when you grow up um I'll be honest, you know, kids are mean and I, I grew up different. Like I grew up in one of the only like minority kids in my school and I was also overweight. And so nobody wanted to pick me like for the kickball <laughs> team. <laughs> I was always the last one. This type of things, like, you know, you internalize those things. You tell mm -hmm. yourself a really negative story and um, and to, 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 to kind of sit with that and unlearn that and... Um, and to start to be kind to yourself, like that's really powerful. So mm -hmm. roots, awareness, kindness. That's how we, that's how we make change. You, mm -hmm. you understand your reason, you, you understand what it is you do and why you do it. And then you make changes in a way that are kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's fabulous. Which is a wonderful segue to your website and that's right your information right. so please share i know it's under construction but hopefully by the time this podcast airs it, will it should be, be. live let's, let's get it yeah <laughs> this, is, this is giving me the motivation to, to hit the button um what is yeah your website? It's, it's rock your life so i'm rock dr rock and rock is r-a-k i know people see it they'll say rack but they'll just have to <laughs> spend a minute browsing and they'll understand um and it's that it's rock your how do you rock your life? How do you live a life that's yeah. worth living? That, Because I really feel, and you know this from your own life and all the lives of patients you've changed, is like, it's not just about like reversing disease and improving the numbers. Like it really changes the trajectory of your life, right? When you start living <laughs> with these intentional choices of how can I make choices that are going to benefit me, benefit my family, and 
how and then it it carries over into so many things like it doesn't just change your life it changes the lives of so many other people that you know right I, I feel like it's that light that sort of shines and then I see it now I see it in my patients and their kids and like yeah. will come in and they'll be like dad is eating tofu and tempeh and and <laughs> he's lifting weights in the garage <laughs> it's like energy you know it's like that's great and so yeah. I want to you know I'm starting this website it's rockyourlife.org r-a-k-l-i-f-e or no y-o-u-r-l-i-f-e.org um I decided dot org because um you know, this is like a social mission for me. Like I really want more and more people to connect with this idea that they have this ability, this powerful ability to take control of their life. And it's really by taking control of your lifestyle habits. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is we have so much now in the way of science and research decades really of how people make change and effectively make change. And and you know this as well as I do, like that's something our healthcare system needs to get much better at is leveraging that and, and, and supporting people to make those changes. Mm -hmm. And so I asked myself, well, what's some way I can start doing that now more for my patients and for other people? And um, I spend a lot of time in these short visits in the clinic, right? We have 20 minutes. Um, so I've also thought like I create things, more resources that I can just basically have them go see on the website um and i do i send them to like you know the big ones forks over knives nutrition facts and um and i also spend a lot of time just talking to them about these these three big pillars that i talked about so i was like well i can i can uh i can share that with them and now you can share this podcast and they can know your whole story that's right that's right that's right <laughs> that'll be cool yeah, that'll be it cool. Will be cool. <laughs> hmm. Well, that that's it's it's very very true. It's um, what's fun though is to when you start a journey like this and just briefly from my own experience and just looking back, you know, this is ten years from me being on a plant based diet, I've been a doctor for twenty some odd years, and you're looking back over time, and you're just like, wow, that that one instant where that patient. I accidentally said stop eating meat and dairy right. and just it I can't even I mean the I <laughs> I'm never gonna forget the journey that. so is cool. just, is you just, accidentally prescribed a plant based diet. <laughs> I did I accidentally prescribed a plant based diet which has now turned into <laughs> you know every year it just it continues to evolve I've um my uh business you know I'm so now I'm chief medical officer at blueberry health which will soon be Mora uh, medical this anyway yeah. there'll be a podcast explaining the name change but um they're considering me a co-founder so there's three of us and Murthy you know he sent me this book he said the, the surrender experiment and um hmm. by yeah Mickey Singer um it's incredible incredible story so you okay. haven't read it I would highly recommend I have not read it and then he wrote a book called the um untethered soul which I read like in a day and then another book he just released called living untethered so basically it's regarding mindfulness meditation but the surrender experiment was his life story and I, I can't even get it like it's an incredible story the journey that this man took and I he lives in Gainesville Florida I've tried to get him on the podcast <laughs> He doesn't do podcasts online. So I'm going to go, when I go to Colorado Florida later this year, I'm going to go try to meet him in person. Oh, cool. And, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's just, it, th those three books, honestly, in the last two to three months have just, I mean, I feel like I've already gravitated towards that. I've already kind of been that type of person, but this type of, it just lowers the, I'm stress. definitely going to, I mean, yeah, I'm definitely yeah. going to read. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be you right down your alley. Me. Like you, you don't have to convince you, me. Yeah. Um, I'm telling you, I, uh, I, I feel like it's just, um, it's, it's opened. It's like, it's opened. I don't know what to do. The door, the windows or something to let hmm. more sunshine in. And it's just like, hmm. oh my gosh, it's like another That's layer. Beautiful. Yeah. It was really cool. It was a really cool experience. But anyway, so there's a, another resource for you, but, um, 
Whew. Yeah, that's fun. Well, you've had, I, I feel like you're just beginning your journey and it'll be really fun to see where you're going because your energy is fantastic. So I'm excited to see where oh, you go. <laughs> appreciate that. I really yeah. appreciate me getting to meet you. One thing I've learned for the last few years, you before we started, you asked me if I've been to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine Conference and I've been yeah. a couple of times and just the energy of oh. those conferences and how and all the amazing incredible people like <laughs> like they almost, sort of connect on this like oh higher energy like wavelengths let, i can't really explain let me tell it, you you know what well, i mean let me you know i tell you what my husband calls it he goes lori you're going to be plugged back into the mothership to be <laughs> i was like yes yes i am <laughs> going back to the mothership because i come back just like <laughs> like, yeah right <laughs> i've never been yeah. that energized from like oh. going to a conference no it's a i mean i've been to all sorts of american academy of family medicine american medical association right. you know we go through all those the regular conferences are kind of like, <laughs> you take yours exhausted right. by the time That's you right. get done with day That's one right. and these you're like every day is even better and then you were you just like do we have to go can we go another day <laughs> you know, know. Just... <laughs> and the food is so good it's all oh. plant-based breakfast lunch dinner and you're just i don't know and even oh. like the stands with like products and stuff it's like yeah. really interesting yeah. services and you're meeting people it's from all, all about over the world healing people oh amazing That's and right. i'm i have friends from literally almost every continent at, at this point from these type of conferences and um the last thing i'll so say boring. which is really tied to this is that yeah. i rem i was i think what i was remind what i'm reminded of when i go to these conferences is goes back to that and maybe it's what you were saying it's that through line it's like mm -hmm. i'm reminded of why i went into medicine yeah because this is what i was called to do to heal people to serve in this the antidote capacity. to burnout. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. I mm -hmm. say the same thing mm -hmm. because it, it was the antidote for my burnout. Mm -hmm. And um, it really is like why people are burnt out because they mm -hmm. see this exhaust cloud of patients stuck in this mm -hmm. system that is failing on so many levels. Yep. Yep. No, I, it pulls you right out of the doldrums you're describing. That's right. Oh yeah, doldrums, and then he had cocooning, <laughs> and where you sort of reflect in, and then calling. Yeah, and and that's and that's what I've sort of been doing. I've been cocooning, and and then I feel oh, like I think I'm you're about, finding I like you're my about calling. Just sprouting your wings like a butterfly. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's a right. Very beautiful mm -hmm. butterfly. Oh, sweet of you. <laughs> but um, it's fantastic. So what a joy speaking to you. And thank you for sharing your thank story you. with the listeners. Thank you for giving me the time and uh, yeah, appreciate you. Yeah, oh, looking forward absolutely. to meeting at one of those conferences. Oh, absolutely. We'll definitely meet in person. So that'll that's always so much fun because you're like, wow. So I always tell people go, like, you're so much taller than I thought you were. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, oh. <laughs> so we funny. said you're five, seven. I'm five, I am five, like eight, about Five seven and a half. I say five. Yeah, eight. everyone thinks I'm like five three or five. We're about two. the same like, height. Well, <laughs> yes, yes. Right. My daughter is little tiny. She's got those Filipino jeans, but my husband's only five six, and my boys are like five ten. And it's like oh, I did right. something. <laughs> my, my daughter goes, "I gave all my tall jeans to the boys." I'm like, "Well, they needed it." <laughs> <laughs> but oh well but right. thank you again and everyone please check it out rockyourlife.org and rock that's right r-a-k r-a-k dot org got it that's, and we'll make sure that's, right. that's in the show notes as well but um Wonderful. yeah definitely check it out share this guide with your friends and uh, thanks for listening everyone thanks for watching and i hope you enjoyed that video before you go though please hit the subscribe and alert buttons so you don't miss out on any of the amazing content we're working so hard to provide you. We upload a new episode of Health & Mora with Dr. Lori Marbus every Friday. Now, if you'd rather listen to the podcast, you can find us on all the major platforms such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and even Spotify. If you're looking for amazing resources to help you start and sustain a plant-based diet, exercise, recipes, or anything wellness, we got you covered there too. Because at Mora, we actually provide physician-led support groups to help people live happier, healthier lives free of metabolic disease. Don't forget to check out our website at mora.com 
and thanks again for watching.